Correct. Okay. Oh, We've got Harbison here. So Harbison is a bloomy rind cheese. So you can see that it has this soft white rind, which you might find um, familiar looking if you've ever had a brie. Brie is the most popular bloomy rind cheese, just like champagne comes to mind first when we're talking about sparkling white wine. So we often sort of just casually refer to all of these cheeses as a brie style, but in the industry would be more likely to say bloomy rind. And it's because the flora that we're cultivating on the surface of this cheese literally blooms as it forms in the cave. So we would add the cultures to the milk, make the cheese, they're rubbery and firm when they're first made. We put them in a special temperature and humidity controlled vault. And if we got all of our make targets right, then we've created the perfect surface for the uh, white Penicillium candidum flora to grow. It's, a, it's in the mushroom family. And it imparts a, an interesting mushroomy flavor while it softens the texture of the cheese. So as I mentioned, it starts off sort of firm and bland and rubbery. And as that rind forms over time, you get a soft gooey texture. You see Michael there scooping out the inside um, and he's got it just right. That's exactly what I do. I stuck a knife under the surface of this rind and sort of filleted it back. So you, you kind of create a natural dish. And so the thing I haven't mentioned yet is how this is standing up straight on its own, which is a strip of spruce bark. So um, this is harvested from local trees and it's literally the inner layer of a spruce tree. So you, we scrape off the rough outer bark, make an incision, we peel off what looks like leather. And it's this uh, very aromatic, flexible material that they would use a long time ago. Uh, I think it they originated, this practice originated in the Jura Mountains um, to keep the cheese sort of girdled. So it creates a natural dish as the cheese softens, it won't puddle and run away from you. And then also it imparts a beautiful woodsy nuance. It sometimes comes across as mustardy and other times it's like what an oak barrel will do to a white wine. You get vanillin, um, more, richness, butteriness, complexity, really. And we've designed Harbison. It's a pasteurized cheese because we have to sell it young in this country, but we worked with our French friends who developed a culture blend to mimic the flavor of a raw milk camembert um, in uh, a pasteurized cheese. So we're really, uh, with a pasteurized cheese, we're able to make a very deliberate complexity, whereas with the raw milk cheeses that we make that we'll try later, it's more like revealing the natural character of the milk and the animals in the land, more terroir driven approach. But this should be a younger wheel might still be a little bit firm, sweet, creamy, uh, raspberry notes. And as it becomes ripe, you're getting more um, roasted green vegetables, garlic um, and cream, definitely with those like maybe mustardy woodsy notes layered on top. Mm. So Jillian, tell us about the wine we paired. Sure. Um, so I thought that the Stagflip Winery Chardonnay really paired well with this cheese. I hope everyone is in agreement. Of course, it's subjective um, <laughs> entirely. Uh, but the, the good thing about the Stagflip Winery Chardonnay is, um, well, we're sourcing the fruit from kind of cooler, more southern parts of Carneros and southern Napa Valley so that we have some really nice bright fruit. Um, there's only about 25% new French oak on this wine. The rest is stainless steel and neutral barrels. So it is subtly oaked, which, you know, I thought was a very nice compliment because I think if, if the Chardonnay maybe were too oaky, it might overpower some of those really beautiful, delicate, um, nutty kind of nuances that, that Zoe was describing in this cheese. Um, and this also has some pretty bright acidity too, which I really like um, to contrast the um, decadent uh, creaminess of the Harbison as well. Um, in terms of the milk chocolate, um, I, I found this to be kind of the, the I don't know, softest, right? Um, the, the creamiest of, of the offerings. And I do think that the, that 
it works really beautifully with the Harbison um, as well as the Chardonnay. I think that the uh, the Harbison brings out more of the fruit and takes away that little bit of acidity and that oakiness just blends in really well with the rind with the, the, the way that the, uh, you know, spruce is in there and they really kind of balance out. Uh, you know, I thought a little bit about the oak, but I think that, uh, that birch is coming out, which is fabulous. What do you, what do you think, uh, Zoe? Nailed it, Jillian. I love oaked whites, particularly nicely acidic and not too oaky Chardonnays with Harbison. Like if I were to describe the ideal pairing on paper, this is it. And I agree with Michael. It, they balance each other. The intensity is a nice match. One doesn't sort of win on the palate when you're when you've uh, cleared your palate. It's um, they sort of finish out together, holding hands. Mm -hmm. And the, the oak and the bark do cool aromatic affinity things. You kind of, you get something you notice more in each than together than you did when you try them individually. So Pauline, tell us about the yes. chocolate so we can get to that. Yes. Um, so for this uh, cheese, uh, we selected the Givara 40% chocolate, which is really the iconic milk chocolate of uh, Varona. Yeah, exactly this one. Um, it's really uh, well balanced between the cocoa notes and uh, the milky notes, with also at the end uh, some vanilla nuts and uh, barley malt uh, nuts as well. And really not uh, too sweet for milk chocolate, we can say. Um, and uh, it's pairing very well with the Harbison because from the cheese, you do have like some juniper, woody, smoky notes from the bark. And uh, those notes are like balanced uh, with the nuts and barley nuts uh, from the chocolate. Uh, and so for me, it's really like a powerful and a remarkable pairing, bringing up like an uncommon flavor and in the chocolate and, and in the cheese. Um, and it's really highlighting uh, spices not from the cheese and from the chocolate. So uh, yes, a very surprising and, uh, and nice pairing. Mm. Julian, tell us your thoughts here. Um, with regards to the chocolate and cheese, Chocolate, cheese, wine, all together? Um, I mean, it's unique, <laughs> like I said. And, and I, I totally agree with Pauline. Like the Javara is, um, it's so mellow. You know, it's not um, overly sweet or overly bitter. And I think it just kind of stands alongside really nicely. Um, I thought it was great with the cheese. Um, and... <laughs> you know, for me, I, I didn't use any um, bread or crackers or anything, but I think a little crusty bread, you know, um, I'm picturing just like being out in a vineyard somewhere with this chocolate, the cheese, the bread, a little bit of this lovely wine, and, um, you know, just making a meal out of that. <laughs> Zoe, your thoughts on all three? <clears throat> yes, I. But you've painted the scene. I can. I can bring myself there in my mind. I. I like the notes from Pauline about the warm spice flavors finding each other with the cheese and the chocolate. Those two together, it's like the saltiness of the cheese and those funky garlicky notes are totally mellowed out. Um, buy that chocolate. And by the way, this is a, this is a lovely milk chocolate. I often don't gravitate towards them because they can be cloying, but this certainly is very well balanced in and of itself. So together, it reminds me of some sort of like mousse, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, a milk chocolate mousse. And I'm happy for the acidity of the wine. I think I, I'm kind of looking for that to kind of cleanse the palate after such a rich bite together. Pauline, you have anything else to say about the wine, the chocolate, and the cheese together? 
No, indeed, the wine uh, will bring some uh, acidity and freshness to this pairing. So, um, still a very interesting. Yeah, I, I, I find it just blends all well together. There isn't a, isn't a conflict at all. And I think that's a, a lot of times when you look at a pairing, um, you know, what, what, what does it do? Well, you know, the chocolate is the chocolate. It pretty much stays the same. You really don't get any variance from that. Uh, the wine and the cheese kind of help each other bring themselves up a little bit. So I think that that actually, when you put the wine and the cheese together, it can actually stand up to your beautiful chocolate just a little bit more because it's pretty powerful. It's, it's got a nice sweetness to it, but not overpowering. And, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, like what Zoe said, kind of like a chocolate mousse, you know, mm. very, very, very nice. Yeah. All right. Any other comments you'd like to make before we move on to our next adventure? All right. Do okay. it. All right, Zoe, you're up. Okay. So Willoughby is the next cheese that we're going to try. And this is, this is a, a sister cheese to Harbison. They're made in the same creamery from the same milk source. And they're both, um, the process is really similar and they end up with a very similar texture. But as you can see, the Willoughby, we dialed down the moisture content a little bit so that it doesn't need that spruce bark to hold it up straight. It's, it's usually able to stand up on its own. Although I do like, an extra ripe Willoughby that's starting to sort of crack at the edges and give way. That's a good sign for me. I have a Willoughby in front of me, I'll get the crinkles out of here, sorry. Uh, that is um, a little bit young. That's a good sign from where I'm standing, which means we're keeping up with sales, but sometimes it's hard for me to wrangle a perfectly ripe piece because we try to get them out into the world before they reach that point. Um, so this looks very pillowy. It looks almost bloomy. There's some white flora uh, on the surface of the cheese, which is not unusual. But the, the main difference besides it being a little less soft than the Harbison here is that uh, it's, it's a washed rind cheese. So we're literally, instead of allowing that, that white flora, which is all over our caves, it's ever present. Even if we didn't inoculate the milk, it's gonna grow on whatever cheese is in those caves. It's a very um, ubiquitous and aggressive uh, rind colonizer. And thankfully it's beautiful too. But for the wash ranch cheeses, we're actively trying to discourage the flora, the, the white fluff, the vertical growing things, and encourage um, a community of microbes um, that uh, are sticky and kind of tacky and orange. And they can range in color from peachy to almost like hot pink. And the flavor profile, instead of going in that mushroomy vegetal direction like a bloomy rind will, the wash rind family, this is like the stinky cheese family. So think French Epois or Limburger <laughs> um, from like the very, really we think of it from being from Wisconsin where those, um, uh, where those traditions landed. This, the aroma of the cheese from the outside on the rind is very earthy, almost like suede. You get uh, like a clean, clean barn aromas. Um, so a little animally. And it's, um, it doesn't always remind us of a, of a food smell, maybe roasted meat, especially um, lamb or, or, uh, or goat, something like that. This is a cow's milk cheese. So when you, um, on the palate though, the flavors tend to be much more mellow and less assertive than on the nose. So we like to say the bark is, is worse than the bite. You might not think you're going to enjoy it, from what it smells like when you're just unwrapping it. But like I said, on the palate, you pick up more peachy, fruity cream notes. And those animally flavors come across oftentimes more as like very pleasant cured meat, like prosciutto or speck, smoky um, cured meat flavors. Mm. This is also a pasteurized cheese. And it's on the milder side, depending on the ripeness. So Jillian, we, uh, we chose the uh, Shiraz. Uh, we you want to talk about that? We are now in the Southern Hemisphere. So Stag's Leap Winery is in Napa Valley. Penfolds um, is located in South Australia, just outside of Adelaide. 
a winery that's been uh, producing amazing wine since 1844. <laughs> when Dr. Penfolds moved over from the UK and established a medical practice, he actually started uh, in the wine business by making medicinal tinctures out of wine, fortifying wine juice and uh, curing all kinds of things, insomnia, um, dysentery, you name it. People were coming over on long ship journeys. So these medical tinctures actually made Dr. Penfolds quite famous. Um, fast forward to the 1950s, where we see a transition from the fortified sweet sticky stuff into still red wine production. Part of that um, was the purchase of the Kalimna Vineyard. So this is our Kalimna Shiraz. We're now sourcing from different um, locations, Barossa Valley being the main primary source. And the Kalimna Vineyard is located within the Barossa Valley. It's home to some of the oldest Cabernet Sauvignon vines in the world because Phylloxera never made it to that part of the Barossa Valley. So we have ungrafted 150-year-old Cabernet Sauvignon there. Um, but what I find to be some really cool similarities between um, this variety and the Willoughby is that, um, that meaty note, right? Um, Shiraz definitely has a kind of a peppery, somewhat uh, camphor or eucalyptus type of aromatic, um, also very savory. And I think that that really plays uh, to the Willoughby cheese quite well. Um, those savory, almost like kind of black olive characteristics too. Um, we don't use a lot of new oak on this wine. There is some old American oak hogshead barrels that this wine is fermented in that to me give, a, again, just a slight kind of greenish, maybe like a dill um, type of, of aroma and flavor profile. But I think really honing in on that, the kind of the meaty savory characteristics of the Shiraz when pairing with the Willoughby is, is um, pretty phenomenal. You know, with the, typically the rind can have some uh, uh, real robust flavors to it. And this has a nice balance to the flavor of the rind and the wine does not overpower. There's a nice balance between that. What do you think, Zoe? Yes, I was skeptical, skeptical to be honest, because the, uh, my wheel especially is on the young side. And so it's not as assertive as it could be. And then I think of Shiraz like with those spicy notes being more bold. So I didn't think it would be a good intensity match, but actually they, they held their own with each other rather nicely. And I love the, as you were saying, um, like briny olive, black olive and dill, those really jumped out to me as I was tasting along. I thought it uh, really punched up the suede characteristic of the cheese. I got that like earthy animal note in a very pleasant way. Uh, whereas on the palate, um, I wasn't noticing that as much before I tried it with the wine. So um, pleasantly surprised. Thumbs up. Nice. Pauline, tell us about our chocolate. Yes. So for this one, uh, we selected uh, Guanara, 70% uh, uh, chocolate, which is our uh, same iconic uh, dark chocolate uh, from Valrhona. Um, so this one is a blend of more than uh, seven different origins of cocoa, meaning we will have a very complex uh, profile. Um, so at the beginning of the testing, uh, we have a little bit of acidity, some fruity notes, um, and then going for more uh, toasted, roasted cocoa, which is named um, cocoa nibs. Uh, and uh, we can say an elegant uh, bitterness that will uh, last after test. Um, and so with this cheese, it was very interesting because it gives also a complex uh, pairing because we have the buttery notes of the cheese uh, that will contrast with the strong cocoa notes of the uh, chocolate, but on the other side, um, we will have uh, the peat and roasted meat, meat sorry, from the cheese you mentioned that are going along, along with the nibs and uh, toasted cocoa uh, from the chocolate. And you mentioned it 
for the wine as well. Um, it enhances um, the camphor notes, so the black olives notes uh, we can have from the chocolate as well. So bringing a little bit of freshness uh, as well. So it's really balanced between similarities of some notes and a contrast on some other. And with the wine, I would say um, it brings um, a little bit more uh, complexity to this pairing, but still going along uh, with the uh, notes of, uh, of cocoa and of nibs. So yeah, interesting one and a, a complex pairing, I would say. This is fantastic. I, I, um, the, the chocolate brings uh, a, uh, a, like a dark cherry to everything. Yeah. So the, with the cheese, you get butter and cherry. And with the wine, you get the dark fruit and the cherry. And then you put them together and you get butter, chocolate, and the fruit together. And that's just fantastic. It's just, ah. Uh, Jillian, what do you, what's your, your input? Yeah, um, I just, you know, um, I want to say I've, uh, I've, I've loved Valrona chocolate for so many years, and these bars really do serve as a reminder of, of just the quality, right? Uh, and I, I, before I tasted the wine, I kind of let chocolate sort of sit on my mm -hmm. cap, warm up a little bit, and just kind of melt uh, exactly. and and really got so many more nuances and complexities out of it that way but then when I tried the wine too um I feel like it did it brought out more of the fruit more of the fruitiness of the wine whereas the cheese kind of um coasted alongside in terms of picking up all the savory stuff but then you're right, Michael, you, you know, you put it all together and it's, it's a pretty awesome combination. Zoe? All right, I, you, you took my note on uh, like the cherry chocolate, you know, with Willoughby. The chocolate, by the way, is, is beautiful. 70% can sometimes start to become unpalatable for me because it can be, you know, bitter or astringent, mm -hmm. almost like tannic. And this is very smooth, very palatable. Uh, just easy to eat all by itself. And with the cheese, it really changed the cheese compared to what was happening with just the wine. So I, I was brought in my mind to those like little cordial cherry truffles that you get at the holidays where they're <laughs> dark chocolate with a little maraschino in the middle. And it did, it punched up the fruit of the, of the wine. And um, I didn't, it really took the whole experience away from the briny olive direction. And that camphor note came through almost as just like a minty um, impression from, uh, from the combination of all three. So I thought it was successful. Again, the intensities melded well. I would say the cheese was in a supporting role with all three uh, for better or worse. You maybe don't want the washed rind character of the cheese to be dominant <laughs> when you're trying it with the chocolate and the wine. So I think in a good way, the cheese sort of laid back a little bit and just added a creamy depth to tie things together. I, I think that those that are uh, uh, hesitant of using a uh, washed rind cheese, this is a good example of how uh, it can transform into a, a supporting character and, and bring all these flavors together without actually sticking its nose in and being overpowering. It's a nice balance. It, it really brought, I got so much butter out of it. And really um, the structure, without the structure, it wouldn't have stood up to these flavors. If you would have had something that was more buttery and less strong, it would have just over, they would have just run it over and we wouldn't have tasted it. So that's what, that's my thought on it. Pauline? Yeah, I totally agree with uh, all of you, <laughs> we can say. Um, yeah, it's a pairing, as you said, like a, with a lot of structure uh, from the cheese, from the wine, and from the chocolate. Great. All right. So another really nice pairing. Uh, really enjoyed that. So uh, Zoe, let's go ahead and uh, uh, let's step up to the Highlander. I really love this cheese. And uh, I was... Uh, I, I think I tasted it last time we were together, which was 
almost two years ago. Uh, and uh, it's just gotten better since then. Takes a few years to fully realize a, a cheese, especially a harder cheese like this that ages six to eight months. Uh, you make a little change and then you need to patiently wait if you can to see the manifestation of those adjustments before you go and change something else or then it becomes difficult to know which adjustments are, are showing up in what way in the final product. So Highlander here uh, is a mountain style cheese that we say, we say it's made, it's raw milk. So we're using um, a very low amount of like commercial cultures and we're really letting the native flora of the milk um, show itself here. It's 50% cow and 50% goat milk. So this is a really exciting development for us. We partnered 50-50 with a young couple um, with a lot of goat farming experience. We're cow people. So we always were hoping to have a goat's milk cheese in our collection at some point, but we weren't ready to bring on goats into our world. And so that partnership has been really wonderful for us. Goat milk tends to be leaner so less fatty and even like lower protein. So um, just a, uh, a little less rich than cow's milk, but very aromatic, right? Uh, some people are huge fans of goat milk and aroma. Some people are a little bit more wary. I like a goat tome and especially a blended milk as an entry point to goat's milk. It's not um, as maybe gamey as uh, like a soft ripened or a fresh chev could be sometimes. So the the aromatic of the goat with the richness of the cow, I think balance each other really well. It's hard to get a creamy, dense, pliant texture like this from goat's milk alone. So the cow's milk is like rounding that out and adding that richness in the body. Um, this is based on a, a mountain style cheese, as I mentioned, which means it's a cooked pressed recipe. So when they're trying to hurry up and make a, a whole vat of milk from, from cow's milk on the side of the Alps in a wooden hut before refrigeration technology. They'd make one cheese from each milking. And in order to kind of get the milk in and out of that copper cauldron, they would build a fire beneath the vat and cooking the curds would help, help shrink them up and dry them down. So you could have a nice firm cheese that would uh, age slowly and, and keep uh, food in the larder through the winter. Um, but the cooking process also imparts some like Maillard reaction flavor. So like some caramelization or meatiness in a way that you wouldn't get if you hadn't cooked the curds. So sort of twofold and that fast make means that you retain a lot of the calcium, the more acidic uh, your make is, the longer your make, the more uh, lactose you turn into lactic acid, the more you dissolve away the calcium and the calcium is what gives you that beautiful bendy texture before you'll see a short break. So uh, a quick cooked make means that you have a beautiful elasticity um, and that very creamy mouthfeel as opposed to say a cheddar which is a longer, more acidic make with that crumbly texture. So kind of two ends of the firm cheese spectrum. Um, so Highlander, I would say the closest comparison to a European cheese would be maybe a raclette, uh, the classic cheese that you're meant to uh, heat up the surface with an iron from the fire and scrape the melty bubbly surface onto a plate of steamed potatoes served with cornichon, pickles and charcuterie. So really nice paired with something acidic. Pickles bring that to the party and especially cured meats that like meaty thing. So in the cheese itself, you get um, uh, big nuttiness. So think like chestnut nuttiness, roasty flavors. You get that meaty gaminess like a lamb chop next to the bone, or in this case, a goat chop, I suppose. And then the butteriness, the richness from the cow's milk. So it's, it, this to me tastes like a raw milk cheese. There's some wildness to it too. A little bit of a uh, little spicy. Um, it's it's definitely like Michael said, it's a work in progress, but it's been really fun to see this, uh, the character of this cheese evolve over time. I'd love to see how the pairings go here. All right, Jillian, let's talk about uh, the Pinot Noir. Let's do it. I mean, Pinot Noir is so, um, I think, elegant. I love the texture of this Pinot. It's very silky, which I think does kind of play a little bit to that crystallization of the cheese. Um, and there's just some really beautiful kind of subtle um, uh, cherry notes, some delicate floral notes that again, I think really do play to this cheese quite well. 
Um, this is a winery that was started in 1982 in focusing on Carneros, so focusing on cool, cooler climate, uh, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay production. Of course, not as cool as Burgundy. So there is some body and weight and texture to this wine, um, but I like also sort of those, um, like I said, floral notes, um, lots of nice dark cherry and pomegranate. And I just, I, I really love this combination. I thought it worked very, very well together, but um, I'm a Pinot Noir fanatic. So there's very little that I don't like Pinot with. Um, but it's certainly also kind of the earthiness of it really plays to those, those slightly mushroomy notes and nutty notes. Um, we har typically harvest this fruit in early September and everything is done in open top fermentation after a little cold soaking to get some nice color out. There's a little bit of stem inclusion uh, to give us, you know, kind of that idea of grip. And I think also that's really softened quite well um, by this cheese. So um, you know, it's 10 months in relatively neutral oak. We're not trying to over oak. We would really just want the Pinot Noir to kind of um, be the showcase and, and really carry uh, the footprint of the cooler climate Carneros growing region. Wow. The, uh... The, the wine's spectacular, and so is the cheese. Uh, you know, this is, uh, when I think of a Pinot Noir, this is exactly what I think of is a Pinot Noir. There's, uh, you know, some nice earthiness through here. There's some nice fruit. There's some, you know, just some great flavors. And I was thinking about the way that this would come together. And um, there's a nice meld, you know, I think that this provides some backbone for the wine and almost a little bit of a structure. Uh, I, I just really like the way that, that uh, it doesn't interfere with the fruitiness or the flavors of the wine. The wine doesn't overpower the, the cheese and the cheese comes out. So you get a nice balance of the flavors. Zoe, your thought on that? <clears throat> I'm a cold climate gal. If I could ski six months of the year, I'd be happy. And I've learned that I, I always tend to enjoy cold climate wine. So while I might not always be able to articulate exactly what I'm looking for, if I have a psalm or a, uh, a wine monger, we'll say, um, that's how I help, help them uh, steer me in the right direction. So I, I, I love this wine. It is um, elegant. I'm glad that Jillian likes it because I think in this case, the cheese has slightly more intensity than the wine. So sometimes it's like, depends on who you ask, right? And if the, if the cheese loses the battle, you know, I might not be as favorable, but I'm, I'm glad to hear that she also enjoyed it because I thought that they worked really well together and that, um, that the, the cheese's character uh, sort of lasted through that pairing with a red wine. It's often easier to pair white wines with cheeses. So I'm really pleased so far with how well this is this has ended up going. Um, so thumbs up here. I think um, it's not sweet. The combination of the two isn't sweet, although there all are some of those subtle caramel, caramelized notes in the cheese, but it's reminding me of like a buckwheat honey. It's bringing out some of that, like those are that the earthy fruity notes. Yeah. So Pauline, tell us about the, the uh, chocolate. Yes. So the next chocolate is uh, Dulce chocolate, 32%. Um, it's quite an untypical chocolate. It's not a dark, not a milk, not a white. It's a blonde chocolate, uh, which was quite a big innovation in the chocolate um, world, we can say. So basically, what is Dulce? It's a white chocolate uh, that has been let uh, eat it, eating up uh, one night by a chef and it becomes like a white caramelized chocolate. Uh, after it took years from our R&D uh, to, to work on it and to have it uh, consistent, um, 
So the recipe is like a white, but you have this very nice, uh, we can say, uh, golden colors, color, sorry. And um, on the profile, you do have like um, biscuity, caramel notes, uh, hint of salt as well at the end, um, and the same, not too sweet. Um, so with the Islander, it was very interesting because there is a lot of sim similarities. Um, so Zoe, you mentioned the ch chestnut nuts, uh, the butter, the caramel um, as well. And so it's all going along uh, with the chocolate, with the biscuity nuts, with the caramel nuts, uh, the vanilla a little bit as well. So for me, it's really a combination of a warm uh, flavors uh, from both and like very uh, comforting pairing. Wow. Jillian, your thoughts on all three? Um, the white chocolate's a little uh, sweet um, for the Pinot, but I love um, white chocolate so much. I love the the silky, buttery texture of it. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was more of a, a textural match, really, than, yeah, yeah. than, than like, um, but, but all together, when you have the kind of the savory complexities of the cheese, it it makes the the sweetness of the white chocolate a little more subtle. Mm -hmm. and, um, I'm quite pleased with how the three worked uh, together. Definitely, and you know I agree with you, Zoe. I I um one of my first wine director jobs after Windows on the World was at Pichelin, where I worked with Max McCalman, and also learned in a world where everyone was pairing red wine with cheese, how much better um, white wines do pair. But I think that, um, you know, the, the subtle characteristics of the Pinot really do work, work quite beautifully with this. I would even like this Pinot Noir to be a few years older, maybe having some, you know, tertiary kind of cool, interesting bottle bouquet going on, but it's a, it's a pretty young, uh, fresh Pinot Noir. But I think I think an older uh, version of this would be also quite interesting to see. Well, you know, when we when we talk about the pairings, there's variations. I mean, we can we can go uh, well, you know, uh, more robust or or less or uh, any one of those directions. And I think that uh, when you talk about the base of uh, the Highlander and the Pinot Noir and the chocolate, the way that they work together. I think there's a nice symmetry along the way. Um, uh, you know, I could see that what you're talking about, about the wine being a little bit more because the, the chocolate does have a lot of caramel. There's a lot of uh, really richness in there and that has a tendency to take point. But again, what Zoe said before is that the supporting point of this is that uh, you have the wine and you have the cheese. So sometimes, you know, you do get one that does stand out a little bit more. And then this is a good example of we have a little bit more chocolate standing out. So you probably could go a little bit more robust, you know, in your wine, in your choices. But again, you know, it all depends on what direction that you want to end up in the first place or what, where you started. You can play with proportions too. So I have sort of like a one to three or one to four proportion of the chocolate to the cheese. That was just enough to sort of take that earthy edge off the cheese a little bit. It just has natural bitter notes that you might not notice, but especially as pairing with red wines, those can kind of bob to the top. So I thought it sort of, if you get the proportions just right, kind of like uh, mellow that that cheese profile, and then the you know, and then the pairing still works with the wine. It was fun anyway. I, well, I think that's something that that needs to be considered on all of these is that uh, how much of the flavors that you put in. You know, sometimes just a little bit goes a long way, and we have to kind of keep that in mind. That um, you know, especially with this particular chocolate, uh, it does have a lot of power to it, but. Um, in the right proportion, it is really wonderful. Pauline, your thoughts? 
Yeah, I totally agree. So um, we do have a lot of similarities between the cheese and the chocolate. And on the other hand, the fruitiness and earthiness of the wine, of the Pinot, um, is still going very well along with it, even if it's a little bit uh, different, because none of them will uh, overwhelm, overwhelm sorry, uh, the others. So at the end, it's all well balanced. Wonderful. That was a really nice pairing. Let's go ahead and get to our last and final pairing, which uh, uh, before we started, uh, I have to tell you that I had a question for Zoe is uh, uh, what uh, she was doing with her trophies. And the reason for that is that uh, they won last or two years ago, because we didn't have uh, any competition last year, at the International Cheese Awards. This cheese, Bailey Hazen, took the, the uh, reserve supreme champion at the show, and she got two ginormous sterling silver uh, uh, trophies that uh, actually have not left England since uh, something like uh, uh, 1892, something like that. The first time Americans have ever won that. And so uh, uh, she has uh, two of those trophies and uh, uh, and attributes to the quality and richness that you think about. She competed against all of the European cheeses, against uh, uh, even American cheeses, and ended up being not only better, but also the second best cheese in the entire world. So, Zoe. That's, According uh, to British judges, we'll take that. In Stilton country, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, right? <laughs> And we're always looking for silver linings, right, over the last year, for heaven's sakes. And, uh, yeah, getting to keep those sweet trophies around the office uh, in, our, in our creamery another year is one of those. So Bailey Hazen Blue is one of the first cheeses that we made at Jasper Hill. Also a raw milk cheese, so uh, focused on, um, you know, managing our pastures, man managing our cows and our milking practices to protect the milk and its attributes and uh, to make the most uh, delicious balanced cheese we possibly can. So Bailey Hazen Blue is known as, I think being stylistically more similar to Stilton than others. Yep. And another attribute about Bailey that's pretty common is that there's a lot of white space as with uh, good graphic design, there's, <laughs> I think a blue cheese benefits from uh, a good balance of, of blue and white. And uh, you'll also know these, uh, notice these like veins that are sort of prominent, uh, depending on where you cut your piece. And that a lot of times people assume that we're injecting the blue mold because that's exactly what that looks like. But we mix the, the blue mold cultures in with the milk and then we spike the fresh cheeses with stainless steel spikes and that allows oxygen to get in and blue mold needs oxygen to grow. Blue flora, I will say, a little more marketable term. Uh, so if you don't spike a wheel, it stays completely white and then it's like sort of chalky and feta-like and sort of boring at the end. Uh, but if you properly aerate your cheese and you build a cheese with nice pockets of air and openness, it's very difficult. It's like making a surface ripened, soft ripened cheese from the inside out. You are encouraging your flora to grow and be the ripening agent, but you need it to grow inside blue mold. Uh, blue flora is very, um, it, light, it needs oxygen, but like a small amount less than what's in the normal air. And so you, you create these little crevices where it can flourish and it softens the cheese, it adds that complexity. And I mentioned the, the white space, this keeps it balanced. It should be cheesy and toasty and nutty first. And then you get the subtle anise spice character second. So it should not be too overwhelming, metallic, bitter, spicy, peppery can be where you know more assertive blue cheeses land. This should be more of a, an entry level. It's big, big flavors, complex flavors, but balanced in terms of those like spicy, uh, spicy notes. So we'll, we'll take that reserve Supreme Champion moniker uh, and be proud of that for a long time. Just gotta find an engraver to put our name on that trophy without messing it up. So that's my, my <laughs> next challenge. I, I was funny because I was there and uh, I accepted the award for them. And I said, well, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'm flying back. I'll, I'll take the trophies with me. And he's like, 
They're valued about 60000 each, so you might not want to take them through uh, immigration and customs. I'm like, oh, okay, I won't. All right. So this is uh, what I would consider to be one of the most palatable, easy to eat uh, snacking blue cheeses. Um, it's just got so much cream, so much flavor uh, that, uh, you know, a, a lot of times you have that saltiness or that tanginess that gets in the way. This has a nice balance of both. So, uh, Jillian, let's uh, let's uh, talk about the uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. Sure, um, and I I couldn't agree with you more. This is um, for me just the right amount of blue. <laughs> uh, just just like you said, just that delicious snackability, right? Um, the cheeses, the Cabrales of the world, and things like that. Those are a little, I think, pungent for any kind of wine pairing. I might even almost go towards a um, an ale of some sort. <laughs> but um, but this is our Behringer Knights Valley Cabernet Sauvignon that I think works quite well with this cheese. Um, you know, I love that uh, the tannins they are there, uh, but they're not too drying. They're a little uh, kind of, I think, very well integrated into the wine. We don't use a lot of new oak or heavy toast barrels on this uh, so that intentionally when you pull the cork on this wine, you can enjoy it um, right away. That's not to say this wine doesn't cellar. We tasted two weeks ago this wine back to 1974, the very first vintage of this wine, and they were all so fresh and, and delicious. Knights Valley is a very, very small um, growing region in Sonoma County that butts right up against Napa. So very similar in terms of the climate and also the, the, the success over the years with Bordeaux varietals. So this is Cabernet Sauvignon with a little bit of Merlot to kind of soften the tannins, a little bit of Cabernet Franc for some beautiful fragrance, um, some Malbec and a hint of uh, Petit Bordeaux as well. So um, you know, I, I love this wine. It's one of my favorites in the portfolio because it drinks like a, a much more expensive wine. <laughs> this actually retails for uh, somewhere, anywhere, depending on where you are in the country, between $25 and $30 a bottle. So that's a lot of wine for the money. Um, I love, again, the salty, blue, crunchy kind of texture of this cheese with the Knights Valley as the backdrop, I think it's a, a, it's a pretty uh, wonderful pairing. Cabernet Sauvignon and blue cheese is one of my favorites. I, I really enjoy that. And this is no exception. You really get the, the wine takes the cheese into a creaminess that's just so rich and the flavors bring out more of the butter, the cream and uh, that back a little area of uh, earthiness. It blends, I think, really well with the fruit and also with a little bit of the oakiness. Zoe, your thoughts? All right. Uh, yes, I would, to go back to the texture notes, I think the whole thing for me is velvet, velvety, like red velvet. <laughs> the mm -hmm. soft tannins, that fudgy texture of the cheese, um, they, they come together in a, in a very harmonious way. Um, especially my piece here is on the lower blue side. And so it's, um, again, I'm surprised because I don't normally gravitate towards this in my head. I would maybe for a white go with a port or sauterne, but for a, uh, a wine that is not at all sweet, usually some off dry character helps round out um, blue cheese, which tends to be quite salty and sometimes a little bit bitter. But um, this pairing doesn't need, doesn't need sweetness to work, which is surprising to me. So I'm like, I'm sort of confounded and, and happy over here. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Pauline, tell us about yes. the chocolate. Yeah, um, so for this one, we selected Opalis, 33%, uh, which is a white chocolate with a very uh, light uh, colors. And it's really a taste of a fresh 
milk, uh, and vanilla. So a good balance between both, not too sweet, and the texture is interesting also because it's very smooth, uh, velvety as well. Um, with this blue cheese, uh, what is interesting is that the white chocolate will really enhance um, the creamy taste of this, uh, of this cheese, but also uh, keeping along the powerful uh, blue uh, character of the cheese, giving really a, a white balance, a good balance between, uh, between uh, both. So we really have a smooth and a delicate uh, pairing between, uh, between both. And it's true that usually uh, we uh, recommend uh, dark chocolate with blue cheese because they are both uh, very uh, powerful, very strong. But it was very interesting with this one, the way uh, it was highlighting the creamy side of, uh, of both. I've never tried a white chocolate and a blue and our Bailey before. It's uh, it is very interesting, and it, and it's what I would want to end a meal with. You know, you have it's almost like putting a little sea salt on a dessert, which I just love. Yeah. You know, it's uh, it, it it's helpful to the chocolate and the cheese together. Um, but if you guys want to get a little crazy and and break Michael's script. Trying this seventy <laughs> percent with the Bailey is also one of the most unexpected pairings. You know, yeah. you sounds like you're familiar with the magic that can happen with blue cheese and dark chocolate. Uh, it's not something you'd normally think of, but it's like mm. it can do some interesting things. Jillian? Yeah, I mean, I think I I agree. I'm I'm just having a blast over here, just trying all the different combinations. Um, I do really love kind of the the caramel. Um, mm. notes in this chocolate. Like yeah, really as well. Absolutely addictive and does really play to um, the savoriness of the blue cheese quite beautifully. And I just think that you have all of these different flavors and textures in play. Like this is a whole party right here in one sitting. <laughs> you know, where you can just how many different flavor combinations can we produce out of four cheeses, four beautiful chocolates and four beautiful, mm. I mean, the combinations really are endless. And um, that I think kind of hopefully speaks a little bit to the versatility of the wines, um, but also to the utterly spectacular quality of the cheeses and the chocolates all together. So um, yeah, not a bad Friday. <laughs> not at all, not at all. You know, what, what, uh, uh, you know, sitting here and waiting kind of for the effect of the cheese, the chocolate and the wine to kind of take in and kind of sit down and, and really absorb that because my first impression was it was uh, kind of like nice, but it wasn't overpower overpowering or anything or that, that exciting. But sitting here and letting it sink in, and all of a sudden you start feeling or you start tasting or getting that uh, richness that's coming in, this is an exceptional pairing. Uh, there's a spiciness that comes out of the blue that wasn't there before that's really nice. It's kind of like a white pepper uh, hit for me. And then uh, the, the, ch the chocolate brings out a little bit more of the... Uh, that caramel that's coming in there. And then the wine, I really pick up a little bit of that structural oak in that, that, that just comes out and kind of brings everything together. It's really nice. But I have to say is that it's also, you know, any one of these combinations can kind of work together. There's so many different flavors that we like and we have preferences for. Like Zoe said, she really likes dark chocolates with this. And to switch them out, I think is really fun because uh, there's always that, uh, uh, you know, where we look at the ability to be able to say, well, this is what we've always done. We really like it this way. We put this with this and this goes with this, but trying something a little different, uh, you know, being able to try these four together and then separately is really a lot of fun. And uh, I know that Zoe has rarely ever stayed on any of my direction 
And I love that about her because she does find, and, uh, you know, you go through there, as you're tasting, you notice that something you might want to add in. We talk about that is like one of the pairings, the Pinot Noir. You could have something a little bit more. So could we oomph it up a little bit and put in the, the cab instead of the Pinot Noir? Absolutely. I think it would work really well. So uh, what's your favorite pairing today? And uh, let's stick to uh, what we actually tasted and then we can shift to uh, something that you would like to dream about. So Jillian, what's your, uh, which one did you like the most? Um, I think I, I mean, I'm, I love uh, very creamy, bloomy rind cheeses. So I really liked the Harbison pairing with the, with the Chardonnay. <laughs> Pauline? I will say the same. Uh, I will go um, with the Chardonnay and the Givara uh, chocolate and the Arbison because it's maybe the more uh, uncommon uh, pairing uh, with a lot of complexity. Uh, so this one was very interesting. Zoe? I am I'm on the, the second lineup. So the pen folds, the 70%. Um, and the Willoughby, that was the most surprising to me. And I was the most skeptical of it. And uh, I think I'm, I, it ended up being my favorite. Uh, I, I think that I would uh, probably myself uh, go with the uh, Bailey Hazen. I, I like the richness that you get through. I like the creaminess. I, I think I have an affinity to the blues, but also the cabs and blues. And then adding in the chocolate was just a really nice balance of flavors for me. So, so did you try something that you would like to say that was, uh, you know, off the charts here that you took away from this? You know, you dug into something else, uh, Jillian. Um, yeah, I'm 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 with Zoe with the with the surprise of the Kalimna Shiraz and the Willoughby. I thought that was the, yeah, again, not a pairing that you would even think of entertaining. So, um, <laughs> you know, I sent the wines out um, a little late. <laughs> so <laughs> I was trying to come up with varietals that were pretty classic, but, you know, obviously quality of the cheeses and the chocolates is um, you know, resounding. And although I might've had some different combinations, like I wish, my company carried a champagne, but we don't. <laughs> um, but I really was very uh, pleasantly surprised with the the versatility of the Kalimna and and kind of showing off the Willoughby. Pauline? Um, yeah, sometimes uh, chocolate and cheese, we don't know exactly what to expect uh, on the pairing. And uh, so I was very uh, pleasantly surprised as well uh, to have such a nice pairing uh, between, uh, between all of them. And yeah, as you said, a lot of possibilities. So we can try all the combination possible uh, and have uh, nice uh, things coming up. Just a, a, a choice depending on the, what you like after and what you prefer. Zoe? your uh, take away my, from a different one? My off script, thank you. I, I try script. really hard to stay with the, the plan, you know me. Um, I swapped out the Bailey Hazen Blue for the Willoughby in the second lineup. So the Penfold Shiraz, the 70%, but then with the Bailey Hazen Blue. And I thought that worked almost as well or better than the Willoughby. And I found that it, it brought out those warm spice notes in the blue cheese, those like anise, fennel -y, um, almost black licorice-y characters uh, in a really great way. And the, the intensities matched well. So um, that was my uh, off the cuff uh, cross pairing suggestion. And I, I would just hope that anyone today who participated here is inspired to, to play like this, to get a couple friends together now that that's like 
we're getting to the place where that's normal again, grabbing sort of a three, three and three and, and, and trying different combinations and talking through what works best because that's how you develop the vocabulary is by tasting with others, whether it's in a formal setting or not. And just talking through like what you're experiencing and tasting in a no judgment zone. So this was really fun. It was very unique. I've never done this triple lineup before. So uh, thank you so much for putting it together. This was, this was cool. My pleasure. All right, so what I wanna say is that you can actually get these products and uh, do this tasting yourself. Now, sometimes you might not be able to find this vintage or this Syrah or this cab, but Look at it kind of that direction that, you know, you have some flexibility, especially on the wines and all that. But you can go to Verona. Pauline, you want to tell them how they can get these four chocolates? Yes, um, quite easy. So you can go to uh, us.valrona.com and you're going to find all the product. And you can also uh, find them on Amazon uh, as well. So very uh, easy to order if you want. And Zoe, you have them in e-commerce as well? Absolutely, yes. Everything here is available in our web shop, jasperhillfarm.com slash shop. But also if you have an independent retailer or a Whole Foods counter with a, a, a cheesemonger nearby, uh, we always love to see you guys hunting for cheese out in the wild because you're gonna find a monger who's gonna walk you through what your preferences are and match you up with the perfect cheese from some artisan producer, whether or not it's a Jasper Hill, so. Well, for Jillian, you are very fortunate because just about everybody carries your wines around the country. So you'll be able to go in anywhere and be able to pick these fabulous wines up. Good. So. Thank you. Yeah, they have some pretty good visibility out there. Yes, they do. So, <laughs> so I want to thank you guys so, so much for coming out. This was so much fun uh, being able to experience all of these. You did such a great job of being able to, for all of us to be able to enjoy it ourselves, which is always a treat because a lot of times we get onesies or twosies and this time we were able to enjoy it all together. So thank you so much. I appreciate the time that you took today and uh, I hope everybody enjoyed uh, this session. This session will be on my YouTube channel, Michael Landis Cheese, and our pairings will be on there along with the websites and additional information where you can be able to pick these up yourself. So I want to thank you again for coming out today. And for those of us on the West Coast, we'll continue on being happy hour. Jillian, enjoy, and hopefully you'll catch up with us. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All Bye, right. Everyone.